Today's guest is son of an NHL star, a former player, a writer, an analyst, co-host of Real Kipper and Bourne, Justin Bourne on the program. Joe Kelly's great Canadian sports show coming up. Welcome to the program. Today's guest was born in Huntington, New York, grew up in Kelowna, now calls Toronto home. He grew up in NHL circles. He played for the junior Vernon Vipers, played four years at the University of Alaska Anchorage, played for four teams in the ECHL, played for Bridgeport in the AHL. He was assistant coach with the Toronto Marlies, a sports writer, columnist with the Hockey News, The Athletic, USA Today, co-host of Real Kipper and Born on the Fan 590, analyst on Sportsnet and Hockey Night in Canada. Welcome to the program, Justin Bourne. Justin, <laughs> great to have you here, my friend. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. I just got to say, the intro to your show is 10 times better than the intro to mine. That's a really impressive uh, opening scene there. I love it. Yeah, with Kipper's kind of like, yeah, here's Justin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm lucky if I get that. That's right. If you get that right. So I'm going to guess that you grew up as an Islanders fan. Would that be correct? That would be fair to say. There's been plenty of blue and orange in my house all through the years. It would be sacrilege to not root for him, for sure. Now, I want to talk a little bit about your dad, because Bob Bourne, of course, was, uh, you know, three times he had better than 30 goals. He won four Stanley Cups with the Islanders. Uh, and we have some video, actually, from his first cup win in 1980 uh, against the Bruins. This is a leading up to it he picked off a pass by terry o'reilly in the bruin zone and watch this bad pass for he shoots he scores oh, boom absolute cannon and blows it by jerry cheevers the overtime winner they won on the sweep that series now your dad had more than just a great shot we got video of him uh with a goal here where he circles around his own net and he's going to take off let's have a look at that one right here so here we are Bob Bourne picking up the puck in his own end. A pretty harmless looking play, but watch this. Yeesh. Through the entire Rangers team before burying the biscuit, as we say. Now, you, you were a baby at the time, obviously, Justin, and some of the goals were happened before you were even born. But uh, do you remember your dad playing? Um, You know, it's interesting because I remember all the things of my dad playing, but the playing part, you know, like I, I have a lot of memories of uh, playing with the kids at the rink. I remember, you know, being there, being around it, being in the dressing rooms, all those sort of things. But I like, I don't remember ever really watching the hockey. I, I did that as I got older and I was like, Oh, that was pretty cool. And, you know, throw in a VHS tape and watch some of dad's games, but, you know, actually watching the games at that time, not really. It's actually funny. The, the highlights you showed the first goal he scores He's uh, greeted by Clark Gillies for a big hug, who is now my father-in-law. So it's funny to see the two of them celebrating that goal. Right. We're going we're gonna to get to that, you, uh, Brianna's, uh, Brianna's <laughs> yes. dad, Clark. Uh, so what was it like, though, having a, a, a famous hockey player for a dad? Well, you know, it's, I guess at the time, you don't think anything of it, right? I mean, everyone that I hung out with, their dads were also hockey players. You know, our next-door neighbor next door neighbors were the Gillies and we, you know, grew up around, you know, the, the nice terms and all those people, like it was just kind of our world. So I guess it didn't seem strange. It started, it started to seem strange. Maybe when we were, my dad retired, uh, we moved to Kelowna, BC. And I, I do remember people coming to our door for autographs after we moved there. And it's funny because you're removed from the context of, you know, the dressing room and, all the other players and all that. And like people still wanted my dad's autograph and I was like, Oh, okay. That was kind of cool. And then, you know, getting some of the perks that came with that as I got older, getting to go into the King's dressing room and meet Wayne Gretzky. And, you know, there were things like that where I got to do a few things, I guess that other people don't get to do that. Uh, I'm grateful for having got to done. It was, it was a pretty cool experience. Well, your dad, he was a uh, Islanders playoff scoring leader in 1983. That's pretty impressive. But we actually have a, 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 a feature that was done on your dad back in 1983. Uh, this might bring back some memories. Of course, you were a baby at that time. Uh, 
Vic, uh, roll that feature. It was foreign. We had never even heard of spina bifida before. It was a foreign word completely. And uh, we learned in a hurry what we had to do. And, and with each doctor we went to, everyone had their different prognosis. And each one seemed to be more grim than the other when he was first born, which I had to give back credit for because he really had a lot to well, handle in the beginning. They told us he'd be retarded and uh, he'd be completely paralyzed from the waist down. And apparently they tell all parents that when their uh, children are born like that because they expect the worst and things get better. But they, they yeah. did feel that way. Yeah, and they did at the time. But, uh, I mean, the good thing about Jeffrey, and, and that's all I can say to other parents, is that you can't give up hope because uh, you know, he just got better from day one. Now, some children aren't going to, but he, he still has hope that he's, uh, he's going to be walking normally someday. On the ice, his contribution to four Stanley Cups has been noted many times. What might not be noted was that in 1981, he was the Islanders' first ever holdout, a fact which forced him to miss the 1981 Canada Cup tournament. It was a negotiation that changed his professional outlook. It has a little bit. I mean, I love the Islanders, and uh, and Bill Torrey and I have always gotten along. But since that day, there's, there's been something there that we seem to hold against one, one another. And we've worked to get over it. But, uh, I mean, I fought for something, and, and I achieved what I thought was right, and they were fighting for something that they thought was right. So I don't have any hard feelings against the Islanders. And if it wasn't for the New York Islanders and Bill Torrey and Al Arbor, I don't think I'd be where I am today. So I want to just uh, bring some context to that. Obviously, uh, we should do that. Your 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 brother Jeff was born with spina bifida. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, is that is that, that I think I think that was Jim Houston's voice, if I'm not mistaken. Brian McFarland introduced the piece, and and uh, yeah, so it, interesting. It was back uh, back your ways. Tell us what your thoughts are when you look at that. Well, first, I, I don't know where you found that. I've never seen anything like that. You know, particularly that included my mom from that time. Um, you know, I'm, I was fascinated by it. It's funny. You know, what really stands out to me is I almost feel like people talk differently in that era. Like my, the, there's a cadence and something that yeah. almost sounds like old timey newspeak today. My parents don't sound like that now. So, uh, I don't know. Fascinated by the whole thing. I have no idea where you dug that up. <laughs> well, we have our video librarian, Paul Pasco, who's got the greatest, uh, NHL video library you can find anywhere. Uh, he's, yep. he did the feature. 72 summit series and uh, i want to ask you how jeff is because obviously yeah he's uh, great you know i i appreciate the question he's he's really good he uh he got married in 2019 um you know he's, he's 41 42 he's been married for a few years they just bought a place he's living in Kelowna, bc on tower ranch golf course he works at the tourism office there he's doing great he's had a um you know challenges along the way with his disability and um, you know, I got to be a part of a lot of the the great parts of being a part of the disabled culture. I, you know, I played sledge hockey and wheelchair basketball and all that things on some of his teams. And he's, he's had a, a fulfilling life that I think that if you told my parents at that age he was going to have, they would be pretty pleased with the outcome. You know, your dad talked about uh, the problems that he had with Bill Torrey and the, the Islanders at that particular time. And, you know, kind of a bit of a holdout there. Do you believe that he made, in retrospect, made the right choice in his career? Yeah, I think so, right? I mean, you look back at that career and his his, his uh, number is one of the ones in the Islanders Hall of Fame there. And they won their four cups. He was a part of them all and, um, you know, had a, a pretty successful career all told. So, you know, whatever uh, hard feelings happened at that time, it sounds like they got things ironed out. Uh, I know that he should have asked Bill Torrey for more money because he didn't end up a millionaire. I can tell you that. So <laughs> I'm glad he grinded for what he could get back then. Exactly. Yeah. Now, uh, you talked earlier about you mentioned uh, uh, Brianna and, uh, you know, growing up next door. Uh, when did you guys start dating? Like, when did you guys become an item? Yeah. Um, when the Islanders inducted my dad into the Hall of Fame in 2005, I think it was. I was uh, at the University of Alaska Anchorage and they flew me down to watch the induction and they're going to put me up at a hotel so I could be there for the ceremony. And my dad's like, you're not staying at a hotel. You'll stay with the Gillies, you know, longtime friends. Um, and so I stayed at the Gillies for five days and nothing happened, but, uh, did get to know Brianna well at that point. Uh, you know, back in that era, I think we connected on my space. She had a boyfriend at the time, but we stayed in touch after there was no boyfriend. And, uh, in the sort of in the year following that we, uh, we gave it a chance and 
fortunately it's stuck and our families are, uh, are grateful it did. We're all, all very close. Well, I, I'm, I'm assuming that when your dad, I know we lost Clark recently, but I'm assuming when your dad is, is Clark Gillies, uh, there's nothing happening. <laughs> he was a pretty With tough that? dude. <laughs> oh yeah. No, no, no. Well, that's, you know, my friends, when I first started dating Bree would send me videos of Clark beating people up and being like, you sure you want to do this? So uh, yeah, I, I had to make sure I was fully committed when I decided to uh, to date Bree. That's for sure. Yeah, Clark, a legend, Hall of Famer, and uh, yeah, that's that's interesting how the hockey fraternity sometimes sticks together like that. That's a uh, that's yeah. pretty cool. I want to talk about you a bit as a player. Uh, you know, I, I know that you played midget in Kelowna, and I was watching a podcast the other day about the West Side Grizzlies, and I want to thank uh, Chase Johnson for the video that he gave us. I believe he, I think he had. 118 points in 52 games. Uh, you guys won a title. Tell us about that experience playing for the uh, West Side Grizzlies. And have we got have we got it correct? Was it a midget team? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Look at this footage. You guys are unbelievable. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, we. Uh, I think we were the only provincial title in, in West Side now West Kelowna. Um, but yeah, certainly I was. I managed to be a captain of that team, and it's one of those things that. So I, I've got a book coming out in February. And one of the things I wrote about is how the titles you win at that age hold as much meaning. Because I did win higher up the ranks. I won in junior and uh, as well. But like winning at that level, you're winning with the guys you went to high school with and your neighbors and your friends from the same area. And, you know, the how much it means at that age, it's, you know, you can never take that away from people. People get made fun of for hanging on to the glory days of their past or whatever, but it's, and that stuff roots deep emotionally. And um, certainly, you know, even the things I accomplished in my career after that, that is one of the ones that I, I consider my defining, you know, most proudest moments winning with that group of guys. Well, yeah. And from there, you went on to the uh, Vernon Vipers, BC Tier 2. Were any ever any thoughts about uh, about Major Junior? Yeah, you know, I, one of the issues was I wasn't very good. Um, but as I, as I, as I got a bit older is, is more what I'm trying to say. I was a late bloomer. So I did have a tryout with the Kelowna Rockets, uh, the year that I, I started playing junior and that being my hometown and it went exceedingly well, like better than I thought it would. Uh, they asked me to play exhibition games, but if you remember, if you play major junior exhibition games, you lose college eligibility. So I was kind of torn. They told me they would throw out the game sheet if I did play an exhibition game. So I did. Uh -huh. I actually, I played uh, an exhibition game with the Rockets. And, you know, it kind of got to the point where I had to make a choice. Did I want to go to school or did I want to go this route? And I never saw myself as someone on the track to play in the NHL. So it just made most sense for my own future to uh, retain my college eligibility. And that that's why I ended up playing uh, junior A in the BCHL, which I'm glad I did. Uh, unbelievable league. And those were great years. Well, tell us about the Alaska Aces. So you made the decision to move to college, and uh, and and you play, also played with the uh, the Alaska Aces. So tell us about that. Yeah, we have a little video. Oh, jeez, Lord, Lordy, Lordy! Alaska Aces was interesting because you know i I had made the commitment to myself that I didn't want to play in the ECHL after my college days because uh, I was worried it would label me an ECHL player. But I also, you know. I was in Alaska. And so when you finish your four years, you get, if you're good, you get chances to play pro hockey. And I did have some AHL opportunities, but I would have missed the end of my schooling, my senior year, which was not really an option. The aces were in the ECHL, but they were right there. And they were like, they treated me like I was Mario Lemieux, which I was not, but they were like, you can only play home games. If you have to miss practices for school, it's fine. So I was like, all right, I'll do the aces thing. And it was, you know, I got the chance to play for Davis Payne, who's now an assistant coach at the Ottawa Senators and uh, was a head coach in the league as well. And I honestly, I learned as much in that sort of, I don't know, month or two that I played with the Aces as I did, um, you know, over any other month or two span of my, my hockey career. Just a great education in what pro hockey looked like, the frequency of play and travel and the commitment necessary. So different than university where you play 35 or 40 games a season. You know, you play 35, 40 games in like 80 days in that league. So um, learned a lot about what pro hockey was about. And I think it prepared me for what to expect uh, heading into the next season. The university hockey experience, so you, are, you're, you, you're convinced in retrospect you made the right move and that was uh, the way to go. And, and uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, for me, it's like I, I 
because I was a late bloomer, it was my first chance to say, I'm going to be here for four years. Like I have the chance to develop and get better. You know, as I came out of midget, it was like, you try out here, you try out there, you make this team, you're on to the next place. You're, you know, you're never really, everything feels very temporary. And that was a chance that you got four years to get your body better, to kind of maximize the player you can be. Um, and, and I think I needed that. It was great. You know, I, I found my way and who I was in university. And um, I don't think I'd have had that opportunity if I just jumped from junior to the East Coast League or something like that. I needed those years personally. Yeah, so you still gave uh, the, the pro game a shot. Uh, you ended up with the Utah Grizzlies of the ECHL uh, one season. You got uh, 16 goals in 50 games at that first season. Uh, guys made it to the conference finals before losing to Las Vegas. Uh, tell us about the experience with uh, the Utah Grizzlies. I mean, it was an unbelievable year. Um, you know, this is part of what my book will be centered around. But, you know, I started that <laughs> year at, at Islanders training camp. Um, and, you know, ended up ISTM with Utah, kind of up and down between them and Bridgeport in the American League. And that Utah team was really loaded. Um, but it was very... ECHL hockey. We had a, you know, a doctor that was handing out pills easily. You had guys that partied. You had guys with tons of talent that were squandering it. You had guys who had no talent who just worked their their <laughs> worked hard to be where they were. So it was, um, you know, an interesting experience in the minors, right? Like it's a it's a grab bag of people and and experiences that's not quite the NHL. And um, I learned a lot and had my eyes open to, to some ho hockey culture things over those years. Was there ever that time when you said to yourself, uh, you know what, I'm close to making it here. I just might make it in the pros? Well, yeah. You know, when I, when I was playing in Bridgeport, I, I got in a run of games uh, for a little bit where I started to feel like, you know, every level I played, I kind of, like most people, struggled a bit and then found my way. Happened in junior B, junior A, in college. And by the end of college, I was a pretty good player. ECHL, I had one goal through 20 games. And as you mentioned, I finished with 16 and 50. So, you know, I kind of every other game started scoring and I kind of felt like I just had a knack for figuring it out. And so, sure, there were moments in the American League where I found myself playing with Kyle Pozo or, you know, some other guys who were obviously NHLers and thinking, you know, I can keep up. I can hang. I don't think I'm going to be a regular, but I might get some games here at some point. So, yeah, there's there was fleeting moments. I don't think I was ever too disillusioned that I was going to be a consistent NHL player, but I thought I might get in at one point. Didn't quite happen though. You might get your cup of coffee, but yet your career <laughs> of course was ended by a, uh, by a, a, a broken jaw. Tell us about that. Yeah, that was, uh, that was bad. Um, <laughs> you know, the next year yeah. when I was playing, I had, uh, I had a couple of injuries and I came back to play in Alaska against Alaska on my birthday. What a cool experience, right? Go back to where I went to school, birthday, uh, passed the puck up to the point, skated to the net to screen the goalie. And as I turned to look if the shot was coming, my own Ooh. teammate took a chin high slapper that shattered my jaw. I've got a 10 screw plate here and an X plate that keeps my chin together, uh, since then. And, you know, that's when I was on the couch in wires, uh, drinking liquid Percocet. And I started, uh -huh. I had so much time on my hand. I started to blog a little bit because I was just writing, watching sports. And uh, at the time, my uncle was a sports writer. And so him and I were writing emails back and forth. And he was like, put it on, you know, logs are free, jtborn.wordpress.com. And I was writing about anything that, that was on TV, the, uh, the Westminster dog show, you name it. So that was kind of where I made the transition from being on the playing side to talking about sports for a living. So you started to write and, and where did you go from there? Well, I started, one of my first opportunities was the hockey news saw my blog and thought, we'll give this guy $15 an article to write for us. <laughs> so, you know, oh. I started to get rich in the, uh, in the blogging world there by writing for the hockey <laughs> news. At, at the time, I think it was like not many people who played hockey at any sort of professional level uh, wrote about the, the sport at all because either you made it and you're rich and you didn't need to, or you didn't make it. And, you know, generally it's not the, not a lot of literary scholars in the ECHL. <laughs> so uh, I think I offered something that was unique, an actual player's perspective. Um, and yeah, so some opportunities opened up a weekly column at USA Today. Uh, you know, they, they'd give me, they could give me a hundred bucks a week, which is great. You know, now that I look back at it. But, you know, started yeah. earning dribs and drabs on the media side. And at that point, I was like, 
you know, if I do this long enough, maybe someone will give me an actual salary. And, and I just kind of stuck with it for a few years. Uh, my wife worked and gave me the chance to earn zero money and see if I could make it work. <laughs> hundred bucks a week. That's what Vic pays me. Uh, <laughs> so how did, you, how did you end up with the Marley's gig? Uh, that came from the writing thing. So I ended up at the score. The full-time job I got was with the score. They moved me up to, to, to Toronto. And so I started doing some play breakdowns because I understood the game fairly well. I was only a few years, uh, years removed from playing it. And so I was just doing a lot of like screenshots of plays and going, here's where this guy should go. Here's where that guy should go. And, you know, there's not a ton of analysis like that in hockey today because it takes time and it's, I don't know, it, it doesn't play well on 15 minute, you know, TV hits or whatever, or five minute TV hits. So it was unique. And I would have people within the game write me and be like, oh, I disagree. You know, he shouldn't rotate there. He should go here. And one of those people was Kyle Dubas and, and Sheldon Keith who were with Sault Ste. Marie and they were reading my stuff and agreeing and disagreeing along the way. And so when Kyle got the job with the Leafs, there was a point where everyone on the Leafs got fired. The great purge, the scouting staff. I don't remember what year it was, 2015. And because I had an open line of communication with them, I wrote them. It was like, if, if you need any hands uh, while you guys are filling those spots, I'm happy to, uh, you know, happy to help out. And he was like, actually, we just need someone to clip video for the draft and free agency. So basically what they wanted to do is, you know, give me every shift of Matt Molesky's or whoever they were interested in at the time. Yeah. So but I got into the dressing room uh, doing that, you know, got to know them a little bit. And so when Shel they moved up and Sheldon got the job with the, the Marlies, uh, they wanted to hire an additional video coach in season. And, you know, where do you go for something like that? We were familiar together, and that was kind of my foot in the door to get started as a pro hockey coach. Well, then you moved uh, from the coaching and in, into broadcasting full time and, and, and analysis. And uh, was it a move that you had to make or was it a move that uh, that just the opportunity presented itself? No, it's not what I had to make. Um, I had a, a son, you know, my son was born uh, at the time when I was working for the Marlies. And then, you know, you travel for weeks at a time. You go to upstate New York, you're in Utica and Rochester and all these beautiful places. Um, so, you know, I wasn't home and my wife was raising our kid and didn't know anyone, didn't have any family in Toronto or anything. So that was hard. Um, I wrote um the athletic was had become a thing and i wrote uh, james myrtle who i knew and asked if they would be interested in having me if i were to become available and they basically said that they would and that they you know i, I could kind of get paid commensurate to what i was making so i made the move for family and you know i'm, I'm glad i did it keeps me in toronto we have a another we have a daughter now so we're, we're in toronto and this allows me to still comment on the game and that time with the marlies was like it was like training camp for how to do hockey analysis, right? It was two years of scouring video, talking about where people should be when and um, and really getting an insight to how teams are run. And so for me on the media side of things, it was an unbelievable education and things that made me a lot better at being on the media side of things now. Now, I, doing some research, I, I found that you were uh, in, you played an instrumental role in Brendan Burke's decision to come out. Uh, tell us about that experience and what 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 happened. Yeah, you know, I, I wrote something fairly early. It was in two thousand nine when I was doing my weekly USA Today column, um, and just reflecting on hockey culture a little bit in my time in there. And the one thing that I just knew inevitably had to go was I, I, the article I wrote was called it's time to end the use of gay slurs in hockey, which, you know, mm -hmm. refers mostly to one specific F word that gets said in the dressing room when I was around constantly, it was like second nature as a fallback. Um, so after I wrote that article, I got, I got good response. And one of the things I got was an email from Brendan Burke who said, you know, that the article resonated with him, that, you know, he was gay and he was working in hockey uh, at the University of Miami, Ohio, or Ohio at Miami, however you say it. And um, I was fascinated by that. And knowing their family history and all that, I, I just thought it was a cool story. And I asked him if he would be OK, if if I would could write his story, if we could work together on writing that. And he said, yeah, he was ready for that. It was a it was kind of a big moment. And then, you know, once they made that decision, and by they, I mean the Burke family, that he was going to come forward and, and be out publicly with that, 
Um, you know, the best place to do that is not on jtborn.wordpress.com. Uh, they knew some people, yeah. so they decided then to, they went with ESPN and John Buchagross. Good choice um, to go with the story. But certainly, I think I was part of their decision to, to move ahead with it. And I'm, I'm proud to have had any involvement wonderful family. And, you know, um, you know, I know they miss Brendan tremendously. Um, I'm, I'm proud of him for making that decision at a time. Not many people were. You know, that was a, it was a strong, bold move on your behalf, I think, as well as Brendan's obviously, but, uh, the, and it, it's been a game changer, you know, tell us what do you think about where we're at, to, where we're at today in terms of diversity in hockey? I know that like Akeem Alou recently spoke out about racism, uh, you know, and, 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 and then he was criticized. You know, it, it's a it's a long story there. But um, let's talk about diversity in hockey, where we're at right now. Yeah, it's a great conversation. And you know, as the face of you know the most generic white hockey guy ever, you know, I, I recognize that it's I'm in a place where I need to be, you know, find ways to bring in other voices and in, include them on our own show you know, that's part of something that I can do, you know, branching out beyond my own personal thing. I think you are seeing um, strides being made. You know, the, the NHL had a influx, a small one, but an influx of, of uh, women hires, you know, I, I think there's five women hired by NHL teams this season. Uh, Mike Greer named uh, GM of the San Jose Sharks was a step and there's a lot more to come. One of the things I thought that was uh, interesting from the NHL's recent diversity port report was that there pouring money into grassroots uh, organizations in hopes that some of this um, happens organically, you know, rather than saying you have to hire this person or we'd like to see more interviews with, with whoever, I think they they would like to put money into Anthony Stewart's Hockey Equality. Um, you mentioned Akeem Alou and the Hockey Diversity Alliance. They're doing good things. Uh, a lot of what what's happening is happening at the grassroots levels to go with the hires that are happening at the NHL level. So uh, there's a heightened awareness. And with that, I think you're going to get a wider view of people. It's going to be the, you know, the early adopters bringing in more people from different walks of life are going to gain from having different viewpoints and different people from different upbringings, providing not just these homogenous thoughts, but some different takes. And um, it, it's great to see it's good for the league and it's, uh, you know, good for hockey as a whole in general. You know, I, 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 we have actually a little clip we have from from a team recently after he received some criticism from uh, mm -hmm. from uh, Steve Simmons of, of the Toronto Sun. Everyone, Vic, you here and happy Thanksgiving to you all. Just wanted to make a quick video to address the comment made by Steve Simmons of the Toronto Sun earlier today. Obviously, being in this space, there are times that people say negative things about you, but you find a way to let it go. But this one got me good. This one got me at my core. Only reason I'm addressing this is because it's all over the internet. I've seen Steve talk negatively about me for some time now. And the funny thing is I've never spoken to him or met him in my life. I actually found out about what he said through other members of the Hockey Diversity Alliance. People like Steve are what's wrong with society. This is the first time in history the crucial conversation of race is prevalent in hockey. And I believe my story in which the HDA is doing is a major reason for that. You have absolutely no clue, Steve, what I and my family have been through both physically and emotionally since I started playing hockey and the scars it has left. When I show this to my dad, he literally broke out in tears. This is a man who didn't own a pair of shoes till he was 16 years old growing up in Africa and delivered pizzas as my mom cleaned hotel rooms to get me by in this game. My dad, who was with me literally an hour ago at an HDA grassroots event to promote diversity in the game in underserved communities. He's still giving back after all the years of pain trying to navigate a sport he didn't fit into. It's so clear what you're trying to do, and that is to divide us. But what you don't realize is that this unites us and makes us stronger. The real question here is, are you saying there's no racism in the game with everything that's gone on? What actually are you trying to do by comparing myself to Wayne, who is actually an incredible leader in the space and is promoting the same message as I? What coaches are you referring to? Guys like Bill Peters? Are you saying I didn't get called a name and get sent down to the East Coast League when I was actually leading my AHL team in scoring in my first professional season? Are you saying I wasn't hazed in my rookie year in the OHL, made to strip naked in a bathroom of five other men and afterward got my teeth cross-checked out? for not wanting to do it again, and then subsequently getting blackballed by all of Hockey Canada as I watch my stock drop? Are you saying I didn't have a trainer walk into a team party with my jersey and blackface, and then afterwards I asked for a trade? Are all those instances my doing? Because that is how the hockey establishment made it to be. If you actually did some real journalism, you would know that the Chicago Blackhawks management team that did everything in their power to bury me came out. Out of that organization came out five National Hockey League GMs. That's close to 20% of the league at the time. Countless others went on to scout and have other management positions. You're a racist and you're an arrogant, and you have zero credibility and respect from even your own peers in the media space and athletes alike. 
And if the Toronto Sun had any integrity whatsoever, you would never write another column again. Once again, I'm going to tell you, you will never divide us. We're just going to be stronger together. Wow, very strong words and very powerful and, and, and gives, you know, those of us who haven't experienced what, you know, people like Akima Lou and Wayne Simmons and others have experienced, gives us some kind of an idea of where he's coming from. I mean, yeah, you know, there's there's more work to be done here. There is more work to be done. And yeah, I, I think Akeem is a great example of someone who, you know, the audacity of any of us to challenge his experience of, you know, of any one period to, to challenge what he's been through, particularly given, you know, recently taking on such a, you know, forward role in the Hockey Diversity Alliance. And, you know, you see him at the rinks and doing all the right things right now. So um, good to see him stand up for himself and what he believes in and, and pushing their cause forward. Um, another subject I want to bring up, I heard you talk one day in your show, uh, you and Kipper, and you you brought up uh, uh, addiction, alcoholism, and, and that my ears perked up uh, for somebody who's been sober for 30 years, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in recovery, uh, uh, 30 years of long, long-term recovery, obviously. Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about your story and, and, and where you're at with that. I know a lot of it's coming out in the book in February, and I can't wait to read it, by the way, but uh, yeah. in the meantime... I appreciate that. You know, I haven't really been, um, you know, I haven't publicly discussed it much yet. You know, I, I am someone who made a significant life change uh, a few years ago. You know, my dad has uh, been through uh, rehab uh, a few times. You know, that's something that uh, him and I have both um, had our challenges and related to this. And, and part of the conversation that I want to be a part of in, in the future is, um, you know, may, normalizing a little bit that some of these struggles are real for families and what they go through and how it affects families, right? Uh, you know, a lot of people deal in Al-Anon, which is, you know, for families of, of uh, alcoholics and what their personal struggles are. So, uh, yeah, definitely more coming out in the book. And I do have, I, I do want to be a voice on this topic in the months ahead. It's, um, I am excited for the book to come out because I feel like, it, you know, a lot easier than me sending a series of tweets or something like that. But uh, a, a great effect on our family, and I think a greater effect in the National Hockey League, in the minors, in the hockey culture in general, uh, than we talk about and then we accept. Uh, you know, I I thought it was great that Bobby Ryan went through what he went through and came back stronger, and we had him on our show this past week. It sounds like he's doing great too. So um, it's a it's an important cause, and a lot of people struggle, and the pandemic didn't help. So something I want to help uh, raise money for in the in the years ahead. Yeah, we've had some, we've made some great strides in, in terms of mental health. Well, we made some strides, let's put it that way, in terms of mental health and, and, and addiction. You know, the sick, not weak, and Bill, let's talk. And, you know, it, it's really important for, for people who have who have struggled because, you know, the tendency for us when we're in our cups, as they say, is to isolate. And so, uh, you know, which is the worst thing you can do. And the, I, 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 I got a real dangerous place here. You know that that I live when I'm when I'm alone, and when we reach out and ask for help, uh, you know, great things can happen. Like I have a life that's, you know, beyond my wildest dreams. Yeah, <laughs> thirty days one day at a time, right? Thirty years one day at a time. So, yeah, so it's Good a great idea. thing, and, and uh, you know, and we we, uh, I'm always trying to to make it clear that. You know, if you do have a problem, reach out and ask for help. There's so much help out there if you ask for it. And it doesn't make you a weak person if you ask for help. But what happens, though, is you become a very, very strong person as a result of getting that uh, that, that help. For me, I've been able to be the, the type of husband and father and now grandfather that I, I basically the, the best I could possibly be. I mean, we, we lost a son to addiction, right? We lost Spencer to a, a, an overdose in, in, in 2014. So, you know, it's a tough thing to go through, but this this affects so many, affects us all, especially in today's day and age. And, and it's like, uh, you know, reach out, ask for help. And if you, if you can't help, do so, you know, that's my... Guess and and my, you know what? The, the one thing that I, um, you know, I've seen with people who struggle sometimes is, you know, everyone's kind of waiting for like a rock bottom or something bad to happen before making a change. But you talk to enough people who struggle with alcoholism and, you know, there are low bottom alcoholics who just decide that they, you know, they've had enough. And before they ruin their lives, they want to make a change. And uh, I, I looked for that at times when I struggled in the past for people who made the change before the disaster and they can be tougher to find, but they're out there. 
uh, you don't have to wait for the bad thing. So anyone, uh, you know, who's struggling, there's plenty of people to talk to and it's never too, too early to make that change. Yeah. The old saying, the garbage can, the garbage truck is headed for the dump, you know, but you can get off at any time. <laughs> That's right. You can get off. <laughs> right? yeah. You get off at any time. Uh, listen, I, I thank you so much for, for, for being on the program, Justin. I want to, you know, yeah, you, you, it's been awesome. I was really looking forward to this. Um, the uh, you by by the way, Twitter. You, Justin is available uh, on Twitter at at jt or jt born. Uh, sorry, what's the uh, Instagram handle? Uh, it's just yeah, same at jt born, but it's underscore at sn. Born. Underscore underscore sn. There we go. Okay. Uh, also, uh, oh yeah, a recent clip you, you from Sportsnet. Uh, I wanted <laughs> yeah, I want to get a little bit of this. I'm sorry, Matt. Uh, no, I'll get yeah, a recent quote. Kelly Yarncrock was my uh, is my t- 2009 Volkswagen Jetta. <laughs> Tell us about I, your 2009 Volkswagen Jetta. I'm a very serious analyst. You understand? I had, <laughs> 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 you know, I. It's funny because I, you know, being on a radio show, you have to have an opinion on everything. There's 20 some guys on the the Leafs roster, and it's like, what do you think of this guy? How did he play last night? And, not everyone did something awesome or awful every single night. Sometimes like, I don't know, he's fine. That's how I feel about Yarn Croc. That's how I feel about my Volkswagen Jetta. It runs. It gets me where I'm trying to go. I got no problem with it. It's not great. It's not awesome. It's fine. That's how I feel about Cal Yarn Croc. <laughs> well, and here's, a, here's an interesting uh, observation. My, Tavar- uh, my Tavares fresh looking legs theory is his kids are finally old enough to sleep through the night. <laughs> Might be some truth to that, is it? <laughs> Well, listen, my daughter's two and a half. Yeah. And like a year ago, I was like, God, I feel good lately. Like I'm on a roll. And I was like, wait a sec. What if being, you know, getting some sleep at night actually affects my days? So, uh, you know, his kids, I think, were born in 2019 and 2021. I think someone mentioned the other day, you know, we're, we're well into 2022, year and a half. I bet they're sleeping through the night. He probably feels like a new man. It makes total sense to me. What's it like working with Kipper? It's great. You know, I, I was a little intimidated at first because he's got a bit of a gruff personality and it can be intimidating at times, but he is uh, very easy to work with. He's, uh, he treats me well. He's funny. I, I have learned that part of that gruffness, whatever is, you know, his on-air personality. He's not, he's not uh, a, a true bear. He's a great guy. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. And our show is something I look forward to, which, you know, I, I feel blessed about every day. It's awesome going to work and doing something you like, isn't it? So um, grateful. I got to get your opinion before we go on on, on the Maple Leafs. What? Uh, wh- well, first of all, what's what's uh, what is it going to take for this team to succeed? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, because they have the talent. You know, you look at teams that win the Stanley Cup. You could say the Leafs have fairly commensurate talent with teams that are that good. It's the tricky thing with this sport. Sometimes you need a little bit of luck. You need some. You know. I guess things snowballing in the right direction at the right time. You need help. You know, for this Leafs team, you know, Sheldon Keith made a pretty salient point about the difference between them and Arizona is they have some elite guys. And to me, the, those are the guys that break games open and make the difference in the end. You know, will those guys find it when it matters most? Are they content being guys who are rich and famous and play for the Leafs? Or, you know, how important is the Stanley Cup to that those guys? Um I don't know. I don't know if I if I had everything they have. I don't know if you know two months of playoff hockey would be something I want to put myself through. But uh, I think it'll come down to those those horses, those big names having success at the right time. So uh, my fingers are crossed with Leafs fans because I think it'd be a lot of fun here in Toronto if they went on a run. You know, yeah, it, it, it's it's easier. The easier, softer way would be just to bow out of the playoffs early every year and go and go enjoy a nice long off season or anything else. But that's hard, man, because you take yeah. so much. So much criticism, so much abuse. Like these guys, I know they want to win. Would you consider one playoff yeah. round victory a, a success for this team? I think it would just be, I, we got to have one, don't we? Like, uh, yeah, I would. I, the bar has changed. For a while, it was Stanley Cup or bust. Now it's like, no, no, no. They just need to win a round. You know, not just so they can stop hearing the abuse from people, but every time I tweet something about the Leafs, they're like, yeah, do it in the playoffs. The responses I get, I just, I'm so sick yeah. of it. So. Give us one round, yeah. and I'll call it at least a mini success. That's a that's a good starting point. 
Well, you know, it's easy to be a leaf hater because you've got 31 other teams on your side, right? All you do have That's to do right. is hate yeah. the <laughs> And if anybody else wins, you say, see, see. Yeah. Oh, it's the biggest club in the world. 31 teams oh, yeah. against the Leafs. It's great. Yeah, it is, it is brutal. <laughs> anyway, th- thank you so much, Justin. I'm looking forward to the next Kipper and Born. And uh, I'll, I'll be listening, you know, attentively. Uh, well, th- yeah, so thanks much, for doing I appreciate this. it. Anytime, man. I really appreciate this. All right. More sports when we come back. Thank you. More Joe Tilly's Great Canadian Sports Show coming up after the break. Guests on Joe Tilly Sports receive a gift certificate from Classica Imports. Top of the line, imported men's clothing. Check out the Classica Essential Collection now. Go to shopclassica.com. Addiction Rehab Toronto, Toronto's number one alcohol and drug treatment center. Saving lives, reuniting families. The only treatment center in the province to offer medical detox, treatment, sober living, and lifetime aftercare all in one place. Our unique and specialized programs are designed to equip our clients with the tools to successfully lead a life of dignity, respect, and purpose. Let us help save your life or your loved one's life. Call today for more information or to facilitate an intervention. 1-855-787-2424 or visit addictionrehabtoronto.ca. Joe Tilly Sports is brought to you by COSA, Central Ontario Standard Bread Association, providing a united voice for harness horse people racing at Ontario tracks. Check out your benefits today at COSAonline.com and check out COSA TV on Facebook and YouTube for all the latest harness news and live action updates. Live racing year-round. Go to hpibet.com for all your wagering options. Become a member today, and your first bet is free. That's hpibet.com. Do you know why that happened? You didn't fix your ball mark. The birds around here are very protective of the course, and when people don't take care of it, this is what happens. It's pretty simple. Just find your mark, fix it, and at least one other. Hey, look at the bright side. We're not up on the northern course. They've got bears and moose. Visit moregolf.ca today. You'll find everything a golfer could need from balls, gloves, and clubs to custom fitting opportunities and training gear. Go to moregolf.ca and get $20 off your first purchase of $100 or more. Just enter the promo code JT Sports. Tour, he's got a route into a spot to continue. My Costa Swiss pick of the week. Last week, I went to Friday night's eighth race at Mohawk. I took Snow Shark with Travis Cullen in the buggy. Didn't look good early, but third on last at the half. What a finish by the Jody Cullen trainee roaring through on the outside, holding off Sporty Tory. Nice to get back in the winner's circle. The 5 4 exacta returned $16.40. This week, Mohawk. Thursday night, the eighth race, second leg of the Harvest Series for two-year-old Colts and Geldings. I like number three, Slick and Quick. Coming off an impressive win, driven by Louis-Philippe Wa, trained by Julie Walker. A reminder, the Breeders' Crown is coming to Woodbine Mohawk Park, October 28th and 29th. Twelve championship races over two incredible nights of racing, several million dollars in purses. For all the racing updates, visit Costa TV on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Go to hpibet.com for your wagering options. This is the Excellent Sports Adventure. Brought to you by Lycom. 
You know, if not for a couple of brain farts, the Maple Police might be undefeated. They let another one slip away against the Coyotes. Two goals in 24 ticks tied it up. Mitch Marner jumps on the loose puck for his first goal of the season. But a late penalty in the offensive zone led to a goal by Shane Gostisbehere. The Leafs had a time goal call back. It was painful, but they should be fine, honestly. The injury to Matt Murray has given the Buds some cap room, so Nick Robertson was called up, as was veteran Wayne Simmons. I think you've seen you know, around the league there's been a bunch of injuries, and um, you know, there's a lot of teams you know, that are playing very short from the salary cap, so for me it's just you know, keep my mind right, stay ready, and um, you know just work. Now that you're back, what, what do you want to bring here? Um, you know, same thing I always been. You know, my physicality. Um, I think my leadership. Um, you know, I think just being around the guys. You know, on an everyday basis. Um, you know, I think that's for me. And obviously, I can say I work a lot, but you know, work doesn't stop. Still continue. Looking forward to watching the rain Wayne train. Uh, the Raptors made their final cuts and are getting ready to face the Cleveland Cavaliers in the regular season opener. They closed out the preseason wild fashion. An overtime win over the rival Celtics. OG Ananobi with 32 points. Justin Champagne made the club. Veteran Fred Van Vliet says this team is joined together. And it should be a good, good year. Last year was just different because it was a new team. So some of the things that you yell and preach and try to teach, they, they have no point of reference. I talked about that a little bit last year where some of the things just didn't really have a point of reference, and now we do. We had a, a full season. We had experiences. We had games. We had practices, hard times, good times, playoffs. So we had a little bit of everything, and um, you use some of those to rely on. And there's not really any inexperience going forward this year, but we still are growing as a team, and it's still a very young team. Oh, the Argos are in a good place. A chance to clinch first place in the CFL East if they can bounce the Alouettes this weekend. They were in Edmonton past weekend. Boatman down by eight late. McLeod Bethel-Thompson with time. He's going to find Deveris Daniels. Great pass. 35-yard score. The two-point convert failed. Argos looking to set up a game-winning field goal. But A.J. Ouellette finds a huge hole. And he's going to take it in for six. It's a 28-23 Toronto win. They're 10-6. and six. The Elks, 16th straight home loss. That extends the CFL record. Alouettes in Ottawa trying to keep pace with the boatmen. Late fourth quarter, Montreal down by three on the move. Dominic Davis in for short yardage, fights his way in for the score. Owls over the Red Blacks, 34-30. Ticats trying to stay in the playoff hunt at Calgary. Hamilton driving in the final seconds. Dane Evans finds Tim White with 22 ticks left. The Cats come back to take it 35-32, their first win at McMahon Stadium in 18 years. Well, ring up another title for Felix Oje Aliassim, the 22-year-old from Montreal, knocked off J.J. Wolf of the U.S. 6-4-6-4 to capture the Frenze Open in Florence, Italy. Oje Aliassim ripped 11 aces as he moves to number 10 in the world rankings. Bianca Andrescu and Gina Bouchard both advanced at the Guadalajara Open in Mexico. Daniel Nestor has been added to the ballot for the International Tennis Hall of Fame class of 2023. The 50-year-old was our guest on this program. He grew up in Toronto, played 27 years on tour, retiring in 2018. Nestor won eight doubles and four mixed doubles Grand Slam titles as well as an Olympic gold medal and four ATP Tour Finals doubles crowns. Nestor joined six returning nominees and two additional candidates in the wheelchair tennis category. Well, the world, she's a change in. How about automated mopping at basketball in Japan? Good enough. Okay, there you go. Time now for our shot of the week. God damn it. Four! Today's environmental tip, avoid using bottled water.
Yes, the process of manufacturing water bottles contributes to water shortages. It takes more water to produce a plastic water bottle than there is water inside the bottle. Transporting bottled water creates more greenhouse gases. It takes over 1,000 years for plastic water bottles to decompose, and the process leaks harmful chemicals into the soil. RICOM, passionate people who turn complicated business problems into simplified technology solutions for public and private sector real estate, properties, portfolios, and enterprise customers. Optimize and future-proof smart buildings from the ground up. The latest in fault locating, base building network design, managed services, cybersecurity, data analytics. Our fault detection will support all smart strategies, define projected outcomes for capital planning, and reduce environmental impact. RICOM, smart protection solutions, at RICOM, we're building a path to a smart and environmentally friendly future. And we want to thank all the folks who make this show possible. These are friends, trusted business associates, and all-around great folks. We highly recommend them all. A reminder that the show is available on iTunes, Spotify, uh, Breaker, Radio Public, Google Podcast, and Pocket Cast, as well as the Spanglish Network, Zingo TV, and Buzz TV Live. Also, you really want to check out our YouTube channel, past shows available, weekly sportscasts, all kinds of cool segments. Like and subscribe because it's free. Thanks once again to Justin Bourne for being on the show. Thank you for watching and join us next week when John Gibbons drops by. We'll see you then. Joe Tilly's Great Canadian Sports Show is brought to you by Brian Gribben Insurance Planning helping you solidify your financial future. At BGIP, what we do that's unique in the marketplace is we show people how to spend and enjoy their money in the early years of retirement without the fear of running out. Also, we're able to do this without you having to change financial advisors. Please look us up at bgip.ca today. Let's book a 30-minute phone call to see how we can bring value to you and your family in your planning. Call Brian today for all your retirement needs. We did. 905-686-5678. Do you want to buy or sell a home? Could 31 years of real estate experience help you? Why not speak to an amazing team that loves to overpromise and overdeliver? Aldo has a tremendous team of experts on staff. They are committed to making your next real estate transaction smooth and comfortable. Call 416 Get Aldo or visit getaldo.com. MNP a leading Canadian national accounting, tax, and business accounting firm. MNP proudly serves and responds to the need of their clients in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors. Through partner-led engagements, MNP provides a collaborative, cost-effective approach to do business and personal strategies to help people and organizations to succeed across the country and around the world. With local offices in Oshawa, Mississauga, Burlington, and more. Their team is here to support you. Visit mnp.ca today to learn more. Hi, I'm Joe Tilly. This November, join me and my wife, Penny Claire, for a trip of a lifetime. Two weeks in Egypt and Jordan. Imagine yourself riding a camel beside the Great Pyramids, cruising the Nile River, viewing the temples at Abu Simbel, exploring the desert at Wadi Rum visiting the ancient city of Petra, and swimming in the world-renowned Dead Sea. Only $41.99 all-inclusive, with direct flight from Toronto, free upgrade to five-star hotels, and the cruise. Visit tripoppo.com and book today to get an extra $100 room bonus credit. Let's travel.